think, as Matthias said, some 40 minutes or so of presentation, and then we go on to question and answer. But you can ask me anything at any point, and I'll be happy to answer whatever uh, question you have. I'll turn off the webcam because it's not really useful for you to see me talk. It's, anyway, it's me all the time, so it should be fine. Okay, so you can see from already the picture that I have there that I am not a fan of, of the plate restriction, but uh, anyway, there are very useful sort of ideas and characteristics of these measures when they are properly implemented, for the duration that they are properly implemented, and for the objectives that they should be used. The problem is that sometimes they go over. So we're going to go a little bit on sort of a tour of a few of these, focusing mostly on the one of Volta, which is the longest one with uninterrupted service and with the most changes in the past 15 years or 16 years already. So as a basis or as background, then of course we have the issue of challenges of urban transport and the idea of TDM. Essentially, the basis of this whole discussion is that we really have to be more efficient about the way in which we make the demand for transport more efficient. We have to be more clever in the way that we provide infrastructure and we have to be smarter in the way that we actually develop solutions and provide them uh, to different cities. Uh, TDM basically aims at that. It basically aims at looking mostly at the demand and that's why it's called travel demand management. Uh, but it really looks at, at, at understanding the demand for trips or for travel in general and how many uh, of, of the measures that would be implemented should be the most uh, effective. Uh, and it does Um, Carlos, if you can hear me now, it seems that uh, me and the others have lost uh, the audio from your side. Okay, to everyone, uh, we will try to fix that and we should be back soon with Carlos. Hi, sorry, it seems I'm, I'm back. <laughs> okay, I'm, good, good to have you back. <laughs> sorry, there was some problem with the internet. It's, okay, so what I was saying is that there are, a, there's a, a main sort of a approach which is called the push and pull that what it talks about is a, we have to improve transport and basically through two main sets of measures. One is pulling, which means let's have people go on board 
public transport, use bicycles, and go walking. And this is what many cities, uh, cities and city governments and uh, decision makers uh, provide as their main uh, set of policies. But you must also do the other side, which is called the push side, and it, it relates to reducing the, the amount and the intensity of uh, transport trips which are made in uh, cars or unsustainable transport modes, and those which are sort of excessive. So that's what it's about when, it, when you talk about push uh, rather than pull. The combination of the two factors is what makes it efficient. It's what makes sustainable transport possible. If you don't have push measures, it will be very difficult to have pull measures effectively implemented. And that's maybe why many cities are spending a lot of money on public transport, but then they find out that few people are getting on the bus. And it's mainly because parking is too cheap, there's no real travel demand management in general, and that's why we sort of many times focus on explaining this through these two sets of tools. And, and, and the push side is what we're going to talk about now. And one of those measures is called uh, the, the plate restriction. Um, Carlos, this, Carlos, sorry to uh, interrupt you one more time, but it could be that uh, the your second uh, screen is shared with us. Um, we probably don't see the full screen PowerPoint presentation. Okay, should be now? Now it's perfect, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so part of this is sort of also relates to the fact that you have to give priority to uh, walking, cycling, uh, and public transport in general, and that you have to give less priority to individual public transport, such as taxis or car sharing or own cars. Uh, so that's sort of the, the basic issue. But it's also true that you have to have a right mix. So to the extent that you can implement travel demand management in a way that you can have the just or the right amount of travel in each mode and the sustainable sort of mix of different uses of transport, then you'll find that uh, you're actually really doing sustainable transport in general. Uh, there's many different TDM measures, uh, land development, public transport integration, parking, regula regulatory controls, which we're going to talk about now. And then there's others such as fuel pricing or fuel policies in general. They have to be implemented as a whole, as part of a larger uh, set of, of, uh, of instruments. And um, that's important that uh, plate restrictions are one of these. Uh, I'm going towards the end, I'm going to compare plate restriction with a couple of other measures. but um, it is sort of one option that you can start with, let's say, and, and, it, and the cities Carlos, I fear we have lost your sound again. <laughs> Sorry for that. There. Okay, there you are. Um, so there's an assumption on too many cars on the road. I mean, there's this main idea which means that uh, we 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 look for a, a main problem, and the main problem is uh, that there are too many cars on the road, and everybody says that that is the main. Uh, sort of reason for which we we, we have congestion and, and many people are, are sort of um, trying to solve this by providing more infrastructure and that's why when TDM becomes more important uh, but we do have that assumption we can we can say there's too many cars on the roads and we can also say that traffic is in two peaks generally one in the morning one in the evening I think that's that's sort of the more uh, Sort of the two assumptions that we can say are okay. So one solution would be to force the reduction of vehicle miles traveled by reducing the amount of cars on the road. 
that sort of one thing that you say, this is what I have to do. Then comes the question, how can I really reduce those, the total amount of cars on the road or the cars on the road? What should I have to do? Which are the ways in which I could really reduce that demand and how can I manage this uh, properly? Uh, we can also sort of to, to complement this idea, we can not just reduce the travel of all hours of the day, but we can sort of focus on the two peaks and then redistribute that travel before and after the peaks. Those are sort of the, the sort of starting to understand what are the, the main assumptions behind uh, plate restrictions. This idea of plate restrictions has come, uh, it started in 1986 in Santiago when they had the, the vehicle restriction. Uh, then in 1989 they did the same or something similar in Mexico, uh, the Oino Circula. Then in Sao Paulo they did in 1997 the Rodizio. And then Bogota started in 98 with the Pigui Placa. This sort of exploded everywhere. You can see it in many different places. There's actually many places that are not in this map but anyway have a sort of the restriction. It changes mainly in terms of when it's applied and uh, to which uh, specific types of uh, license plate it's applied, uh, which is something very sort of interesting to see the differences. But essentially there's two main types. One is when it's on uh, odd and even and the other is when it's uh, with a combination of different license plates, which is what I'm going to explain now. And the first of these is the, the one that's all day. Uh, when you have what it's called odd and even schemes, it's all cars with a certain license plate cannot circulate during the entire day. And when you do odd even, theoretically 50% of the vehicles are off the roads every day. 50% of the vehicles that are registered. And that's sort of one of the important things. It's, it's essentially a good idea because you're getting half of the cars off the road, but it's a good idea for today, for tomorrow, for the next week, and for the coming months, but in the medium term it will have some uh, problems which we'll see later. Because the problem starts here. If income is high enough, then people will be aiming at buying a second car which does not have a restriction. So it's the 50% starts to be reduced because essentially the household will buy a second car with another license plate. So then they end up saying, okay, that's my second car for the restriction day. So you're rendering the license plate restriction obsolete. And it will generate more traffic than before because then what you're generating is more options of driving within a household. And that's what you're having. What you're getting is a, house, a household which had one car, then a restriction was implemented, then they bought a second car to avoid the restriction, but then what happens is that during the weekends or, or depending on the restriction in periods when the restriction is not working, then they generate uh, more, uh, uh, more traffic than before. Thank you for, for, the, uh, for the example of Athens. I always take note of of these other examples. So Bogota started by saying, by having a very good idea, and what they did was they they made it a little bit different, and, and it's based on the table that you see here. Depending on the day of the week, then you will have restrictions for cars with plates ending in specific numbers. So if you can look at this, it's only four cars are, 40% of the cars are going off the streets during peak hours. It's a 40% reduction, but then you have this twice a week and people will actually not be so willing to buy a second car. Because what ends up happening is that you would need three cars in order to avoid the license plate restriction. And this was sort of the genius of uh, uh, Picri Placa in Bogota, is that they were avoiding two things. It was not a full day thing, and it was not 
something which you could get out of by buying a second car, but you actually had to buy three cars to get out of it. If, if you look at the at the at the numbers, you'll see that you really need three cars to really be out of uh, the plate restriction for the whole week. So this essentially restricted everybody uh, from buying the second car. A few people would buy the third car, but anyway, they started to sort of uh, not uh, do the same that was happening in Santiago or in Mexico. So the basic scheme um, the Delhi example is also uh, very interesting. Um, and the plate idea of buying another plate is also a, a, another idea which we'll talk about uh, towards the end. The basic scheme of Bogota is based on the last number of, of the license plate. As I said, each day is for numbers. And it started by being 7 to 9, 5 to 7 p.m. So if you look at the graph, this is when you would have a restriction. And what you end up having is that people would start to either get up early to get to work before 7 and leave before 5, or many of them would arrive after 9 and leave after 7. So, so in the end, what you're doing is you're shifting. As I said, you're shifting traffic from one side to the, to the other. Um, and then they started to change. In 2004, they said, OK, wait. What we have to do is we have to change this because we're getting more traffic. So let's do it for 6.30, starting at 6.30 in the morning and starting at 4.30 uh, in the afternoon. But this will only apply to those cars which are registered outside of Bogota. The aim of this was to get greater tax revenue because cars which were registered in Bogota were very few. So then they said, if we give the restriction to the cars outside of Bogota, then we'll get more cars being registered inside of the city. And then it will, we will start getting a lot more um, registration. And then another thing that they did is that they started to rotate the license plates um, a little bit. Every six months or every year, they would change, or they do change. So if you have a license plate that would have a restriction on Friday, which at the beginning would be number 7, 8, 9, and 0, uh, the government would be kind enough to let you go out on a Friday night on, in your car after six months, because then they would shift it little by little. So what would happen is that you, if you had a car which was a license plate ending, uh, having a plate restriction on a Friday, you would never be able to sell it. But then when they started shifting it, then it would be easier because then, of course, you would have a car which eventually would have another restriction. But then they did. They said, OK, we're still having more traffic. Let's do it 6 to 9 in the morning, 4 to 7 p.m., all cars. What ends up happening here is that few people will get up earlier than 6 in the morning or arrive earlier than 6 in the morning to the office, right? So it makes it much more difficult to people, for people to arrive so early. So this side of the equation no longer works. What you start getting is people who are either arriving later or, or being crazy enough to arrive before 6 in the morning at their office. And because this is until 7, then you would have people leaving after, after 7 in the evening. So what you can see is that traffic got hold of Bogota because there were more cars, because there were more registered cars, and eventually the car population would catch up with the rest of the, of the, of, of the license plate restrictions. So in the end, you were generating something which was not working, or that was working, but because of the um, increase in the, in the population of cars, would stop working uh, uh, after a while. And now we have something which is, at one point we came back to something which is all day. So we had a, a restriction which is all day. So of course this, this, this kills the option of coming earlier or coming later. And it also kills the option of having it more flexible. We're back to Santiago de Chile in 1986 when they did this at that point. So then you're, 
trying to solve the problem, you're actually generating a bigger problem. This is Bogota during peak with Placa. Exactly that. And I like the picture on the top because it shows Transmillennium. Essentially, what is happening in Bogota now is that people are starting to understand that going by car is not a good idea. The bad thing is that they're not necessarily understanding that they have to get on public transport. They're actually paying uh, for a motorbike because motorbikes don't have the plate restriction. So that's when you get a little bit of a problem because you end up having this this issue of not having uh, uh, actually the better options and probably because of the license plate restriction you increase the amount of cars on the road the amount of registered cars and the amount of cars which would be available to to be used sao paulo did something which is similar uh, you never know if it's working or not 7 to 10 in the morning, 5 to 8 p.m., but only two plates per day and within a certain area. So it's very similar, but of course, I'm, we're going to look a little bit at some of the effects of, of, of the Rodizio or the, the evolution after the Rodizio to see that it, it really wasn't very useful either. Some of the effects that may, of the Mexican initiative were this you can see in the blue the days with the, con the maximum concentration below 0 0.11 ppm and the maximum yearly concentration uh, of, the, of the limit of 0 0.11 ppm. So it seems that things are better. Uh, but then there have been some studies. I'm showing the Mexico example because Mexico is the one which has had the most studies done by many different people. Um, a government study of 1997 found that their scheme increased the used car price 11.5%, of course, because people were buying more cars, more second cars, so of course they would, they would buy a used car which was cheaper. The University of Michigan found out in 2008 that it was not easy to attribute the effects from the scheme to air quality, but the vehicles in circulation did increase 10% and it was not effective for mode shift. They also found out that the measure was affected in the short term. It reduced circulation in 20%, not in the medium term. Uh, there was an adaptation and an increase in 22%. They didn't really find much in the longer term. Other researchers in 2003 found that there or said that there were no real incentives to uh, push and pull. And they also said we have to see this as a package of measures. So you can see that things start to happen and people start to find out things which are similar. So the problems are the second or even the third car phenomenon. Of course, this happens only in the cities where income is high. If you look at motorization rates and GDP, you'll see that after $5,000 of GDP per capita, you'll start seeing a, a higher motorization and a more accelerated motorization. So having a plate restriction in something which is above that $5,000 GDP per capita could be a bad idea. Uh, there's also other things that I like to call the pigwi placa mom, which is the head of the household, the one who is the breadwinner, ends up using the car, which does not have the restriction. Uh, the, the, the other person, which is not the lead breadwinner, ends up uh, with the other car and can only use it during restrictions. And of course, there's an effect which happens in Bogota on the Saturday because Saturday does not have pick with placa. So there's groceries, issues with groceries, issues with running errands, uh, which are pushed back to Saturday. So then the, this, the, the traffic jam on Saturday is something of, like what you see on the, on the right. Uh, this graph is from Sao Paulo, which is showing the vehicle growth. Um, in, in Sao Paulo, so you can see that there's no real, I mean, there isn't a considerable increase also during the time that, that the Rodizio was implemented. So in the end, what you have to understand is that the car population is anyway increasing. So the traffic will eventually increase again. And the congestion will eventually be the same. But the problem is that you have the same congestion as before, or even more as before, with the license plate restriction. 
So you're only delaying the problem. It's, it's actually, it's, it's exactly that. The, the plate restriction is delaying a problem. So in that sense, it's a good idea. If you delay the problem and in the meantime find another solution. That's essentially the main thing. You have to really find the best way to use the license plate restriction. Uh, okay, enforcement is something that, that that is also a good question. Uh, I don't have that in this presentation, but it's interesting to, to mention that now. Uh, one way in which at least the Piggy Placa in Bogota works is that the penalty and the fine for not for riding your car in Transmilenio is two hundred dollars. And if you get caught by uh, more than once while you're riding your car in the same day, it doesn't matter, then you get the same penalty over and over again. So even ten blocks, ten policemen stop you with a license plate restriction, you have to pay all the ten times, so two thousand dollars. So that really reduces the, the, the chance that people are actually um, not uh, sort of uh, using uh, their car during a license plate restriction day. Uh, it's of course an issue towards the beginning, but it has to be implemented, uh, a stronger control on the road and a very, very strong penalty, but it has to be something which is delaying uh, uh, a problem so that you can find a solution. That's essentially the, the message of, of how to use license plate restrictions. When you look at Bogota, the Secretary of Mobility once showed the average speed which dropped. I mean, so then you cannot see any real effect of Pigu Placa on increasing the speed. This is a motorization rate in Bogota, which also you can see an increase. Uh, which is more driven from GDP, but of course you, you can also think about some impact of Pico Placa. And there's a researcher here which is called Carlos Moncada, and this is one of his graphs, based on uh, one of his graphs where you can see uh, the impact of uh, Pico Placa and the evolu rather the evolution of uh, the private fleet of cars. But then you see motorbikes, and then you can see that motorbikes really started to increase their sales after 2005. So there is a tendency to buy another vehicle that probably more aimed at motorbikes, and that could be one of the things that you can really find out that, that, that happened in Bogota. Not just did we come back to the same congestion as before and worse, but we also started to see a lot of motorbikes on the road, and that's sort of essential to to the message as well. If you're going to do license plate restriction, you have to really find what was it that really started to happen. Ten cities in Colombia have license plate restrictions. This is both the motorization in Colombia and in Bogota, but I think this is more uh, uh, linked and uh, dependent on GDP rather than the good luck. And this is one of the issues that is problematic now. The explanation of Pico Placa is any of the two that you see here. The one on the left, which is from a newspaper, the one on the right, which is the, which is the one uh, in, in currently from the government. Uh, it's so complicated. I mean, I, nobody understands this. Nobody really knows. We even have something which says that you can go with, you have to go with minimum three people in the city center, but nobody really applies it. Uh, so it's, it's actually something really, really complicated that ends up being completely annoying to anybody on the road. And it's not easy to explain. Previously, in the first time, it was really easy to explain. Now, it's, it's really not so easy. And, and it, it, it generates a lot of confusion. And it's not simple. And the measures like this should be really simple. You either have a restriction or you don't have it, but it's not so much that you have all these very complicated drawings trying to explain what Pico Placa is. And then also you have this, because of all these evolutions, you end up having things like this, which is this sign entering the city, 
they're trying to explain to people what liquid black eye is now, but it's so it's changed so many times that you no longer have anything clear. This is restriction of of individual vehicles, and then the time is not really under, well understood. And here it says every day, and then it says Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, six to eight. Uh, every day, uh, odd one, three, five, seven, nine. So you really don't understand what is happening, even from the moment that you you understand. Um, uh, I mean, it, it's impossible, really. It, it's really, really difficult to understand. And of course, many times they start to have some disgruntled users, which have had some uh, disappointments when when there's changes and and it's really difficult to find car users doing uh, uh, this type of uh, uh, problems but or or protests but of course it's sometimes it happens uh, okay there's a long question that somebody was asking uh, which I'll look at later uh, and then we can see the push and pull uh, factor. Um, some research on the effects uh, that that has been seen. Uh, there's a very nice study from 2011, which is a mathematical modeling of the effects. Uh, there's a short-term positive response they found, but after 11 months they started to see a, an increase in vehicle population. The Quito government report also found out that the improvement in travel times uh, uh, at the beginning, but later was worsened because of additional taxi and other traffic. Uh, there was an independent study in 2011 in Bogota which found out that 13.7 of income per capita was lost and they said evidence allows a conclusion if benefits are not considerable, this restriction is not advisable and other alternatives should be sought like congestion charging. There's also a government report from Bogota which says that the traffic speed is reduced while 87.5% of increase in vehicle population. So you really don't find any positive effects after reading all these things. You, you find some positive effects in the short term, not so much in the medium and long term. There's some interesting ideas similar to this. Singapore, which has a congestion charging, has off-peak cars. They have a red license plate, they have cheaper taxes, and they can, can be driven freely outside restricted hours, and they can get a valid license day, a electronic day, license to drive during the weekday. So it's a car that's not used so much, they can have this red license plate, you can go to that website and find uh, what each of these are. are. The scheme is working, uh, but it's interesting to see that it's more linked to the license plate as such, and it's a scheme very limited to very specific uh, types of cars. How do you make a license plate restriction last longer? Um, Okay, thank you for this uh, idea. The, the Singapore is automated enforcement through uh, uh, the, the recognition of the different cars. So you apply the restriction to the peak periods only. That's one thing which we saw in Bogota. You ban four numbers each day. You, we saw this in Bogota. You change the number combinations quarterly or biannually. Uh, that's something we also saw in Bogota. Two more things which you could do, vehicle registrations at the same address receive the same ending plate number. This is very difficult to implement, but you could do it eventually. And requiring new number plates for used car purchases uh, could also be another way which would be combined with number four. Of course, you see that three of these are implemented in Bogota, but you could sort of try and do the others to sort of find a way. There's other alternatives. Combine the plate restriction with pricing, pay to ride on your peak day, or rather change your charge for the license plates, either the option or the fixed cost, and in general try to have pricing. Uh, that's what I'm going to talk about towards the end. Uh, so in conclusion, this seems to work with existing amount of congestion, not when it's increasing. It's not useful in the long term if car populations and VMT increase. It's useful if traffic will not increase, if GDP will not increase. So in general, it's, it's not so easy to evaluate for many cities in, in the world. And then the last two slides, the congestion charging is different from plate restrictions because the congestion charging is based on an ideal level of congestion and then you apply a cost. That's the key issue. You are applying a price. 
And even if the car population increases, the vehicle miles travel within the zone will not increase when it's properly planned because you adjust the price. That's the essence behind these differences. When you have with black or license plate restriction, you're actually regulating, only regulating. And then when you have regulation, you will have this increase of uh, car population, which you cannot stop. When you have something like congestion charging, you have a price which you can adjust depending on traffic. So if traffic is very bad, then you increase the price. If traffic is very very good, then you can reduce the price. But with the speed black, you can either put it or, or put it back. The difference is with parking policy, which is one other measure which you could do, is that the tariffs for parking are based also on an ideal level of parking and on available parking spaces when they're implemented properly. But if the demand or willingness to pay increases, the cost for parking will increase accordingly. Again, it's the issue of pricing. If you have pricing, then you have a way of explaining to the user exactly how much they're paying for how much congestion. And in parking, when you do it properly, you can do it in such a way that the, oh, the supply and the price is adjusted to the demand. And that is really demand management. And that really sort of makes you understand when you have to take the car out, uh, how much you're going to pay. And you can say if you're willing or not to pay that, um, and, and, and it can work much better. Uh, that's the presentation that I had. I want to leave, as, as Matthias said, 15 minutes for, for questions. Uh, this is my email, and, and you can write to me if you have any questions. There were already some different questions from from some of you. So so you can use the chat to put your questions, um, and then uh, somebody else was was talking about some of these issues. While some people make some of the questions, I'm going to talk about uh, one of the things which we're starting to we were starting to talk about. Um, I talked about enforcement already. Um, India um, was also interesting in th that they did the, the odd and even uh, some some months ago, uh, uh, but of course the, the improvements were not so good. Um, the, the issue asked by somebody saying that you can buy another license plate is interesting. There's a lot of different ways to, to cheat. Because many people actually buy a, a license plate or they actually paint their license plate or, or there's actually some mechanisms which have a license plate which rotates and it's a machine that is being sold in the black market. So there's a lot of ways of cheating uh, and cheating is really interesting but of course completely illegal. Um, there was also this this question about the, the successful public transport schemes of Bogota and, and Mexico. And yes, the question is if these systems were simply not strong enough to push or sh pull or shift people's behavior. Um, public transport can improve uh, a lot of the problems of existing users and it may pull some people from the car. But in general, it doesn't really um, do the whole uh, homework to improve in terms of pushing people out of the car. And I guess you can see this from many different studies of many different systems. You can find that a third of the BRT users, both in Bogota and in Mexico, were previously car users. And these were mostly students or people who were really, didn't really have so much um, money to really pay for parking or to pay for the, 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 I mean, the car in general, the use of the car. Uh, the question about why plate restrictions are, are used more often is because it's more easy. And because congestion charging, cordon charges, and these types of, of measures are politically difficult to implement. And uh, they are, uh, I mean, it, it's difficult to implement. So then you will not, uh, uh, find many mayors who will be able or willing to do this. So as, as Gabriel said, it's political cowardice. Uh, 
the political the implementation cost is really not extremely high, uh, and and because you're charging for the congestion charging, then you can you can offset the cost from your revenue uh, in the end. But it is sort of a, a, an interesting question, and what you were asking. Uh, and yeah, congestion charging is a way to commit political suicide many times, as long as you don't have sort of a, a, a very strong mayor who is willing to commit and early on in their in their mandate. So that's uh, that's really interesting. Um, and of course, the, the London example is one interesting example. It was done, it was done very successfully. It was very expensive, but they also had a very, very strong mayor. Same as in Singapore, the government is very strong, so then they're able to do these kinds of things without a very large amount of uh, problems. I actually have some of these examples here uh, after this, um, sort of. Uh, this reducing road capacity. I mean, I guess there's another webinar on DDM, which you can see in the in the in the Capsule website. Uh, but some of the examples of this are destroying uh, or reducing road capacity, which was done in San Francisco, in Portland, in Seoul. Uh, there's other measures which are vehicle taxation, vehicle pricing. Um, Yes, and there is, um, from our colleagues in China, they have done for, uh, in the context of their work in China, they have been analyzing different congesting, congestion charging schemes uh, and summarized also the study results in terms of um, congestion and air pollution reduction and so on. They have um, reflected on the income that has been generated on, on the coasts. And um, yeah, later on in the pre presentation that we will share with you, you will also find the link um, to that study. So um, when you're interested really to get into congestion charging, um, yeah, we I can recommend to consult that uh, publication as well. Yeah, um, and, and, mm -hmm. and, and if you have it handy, you can maybe put it on the chat so that people can know already, because many times when it's only in the, in, in the, in the, in the PDF, it's not easy to, to copy. Yeah, I will share that link in the chat function. Okay, so then there were also other, I mean, there's the France uh, scheme, which is also doing some uh, charging for different uh, measures, the Singapore scheme. I mean, in the end, you can find many different uh, measures of, of which are different from congestion, which are different from license plate restriction, but which are useful uh, for these kinds of things. Uh, I'm going to start copying while people, if they have other questions, um, I'm going to start copying some of the links that you see on the screen so that you can have them to click. Uh, there's one on TDM, it's a module. There is the Introducing Congestion Charging technical document. There's a parking management document and you can also see them in, in that link. Matthias has just put uh, one, the, the, the link for the, for the study that was done in China with the GIZ colleagues. There's also the Capsule website. Um, which is in, in I, sorry, I have I wasn't pasting it. Yeah, I have done the same. <laughs> um, one second, I will simply switch to um, my screen, and then we can actually open that. I guess also here. Um, now everyone should see my screen. Yeah, with the recommended reading here. Yeah. Yep, and so here will, you will find uh, those um, three topics which uh, Carlos has been uh, excellently mentioning, um, the uh, entire topic of transport demand management, um, the module on parking management, which you can see here in the uh, down right corner, and the publication on congestion charging. You will find them all under uh, this one central link here on sutp.org. Um, yes, on Capsuit here you will find later on uh, also the recording of this webinar in the case you uh, want to rehear some of the things or uh, also for those ones who couldn't attend today's webinar and on that side we will also 
um, upload uh, Carlos' presentation later on um, with uh, more of the slides on general TDM issues as well as on the other examples uh, Carlos has mentioned. So there you will find uh, even more extensive information than um, has been presented today. Yes, um, we are almost... Um, we're not yet, no, we still actually have a bit of time. So um, the question to the audience, uh, if someone of you wants to share some further experiences or has some uh, further questions, uh, you're still welcome to, to address these questions in the chat function. Or you can also give me a sign and I will unmute your microphone so that you can uh, simply uh, talk to everyone here. Yeah, okay. Meanwhile, there is no question yet. Um, I will simply show you some uh, further of our links. Um, so here you will find some links to the comprehensive sources of uh, GIZ Transport and Mobility. Um, as Carlos already said, on SUTP.org and uh, Capsuit, you will find a lot of information as well as on the transport overview page of uh, GIZ. Um, you will find a photo database uh, where you will find a lot of good uh, pictures on uh, topics of congestion that you may use for your presentations or publications. Uh, the authors are mentioned in that uh, in uh, at every picture um, and you will also you can you can find our communications through Facebook and uh, Twitter here. Yeah. yeah. Meanwhile there has been a question from uh, from Greece from Gabriel Maki again. Yeah and, and then yeah Brazil hasn't really been able to implement anything yet. I mean, they have been talking about congestion charging since 2002 or so and haven't really been able to to implement anything because, of course, of the political uh, challenge. And, and yeah, they, they don't really... It's very difficult for them to really implement something. Probably in Sao Paulo there may be something coming up, but, but it's not really highly... Uh, probable. There was some. There was one person from, but I think he left already. Diogo, who is actually living in Sao Paulo, but he's no longer here. Uh, but yeah, that was uh, Ah Daniel. But if Daniel is here, maybe we can give the microphone to Daniel. You can speak for two minutes because you. She may be the person who knows most about this topic in in Brazil that I know of. Uh, but you cannot have a microphone, no? Daniel, you're in the web. Mm -hmm. Let's try. No, you can't, you can't have a sound. But if you can give a, through the chat at least, some specific... Um, I mean, is there any news from the Sao Paulo? that you can share with us. I mean, just to give you, uh, Danielle worked for ITDP Brazil and, and, and she actually helped a lot in one of the studies that we did uh, with IDB for parking. Um, so it's a pity that you can't, uh, you didn't connect through the regular thing. Um, but yeah, probably this, this other one that is being mentioned here, the Salik, it, it's it's a little bit different the tolling. It's exactly as as Gabriel says. Tolling is a little bit different from congestion charging because you really have, don't have uh, um, you're not really reducing congestion. You're actually paying for uh, for the development of the road as part of a concession. Um, and yeah, Daniel is actually mentioning through the chat that some discussions have been going on, but of course. <laughs> Uh, it's really difficult in Brazil. I think I, I think later at one point we could have uh, maybe even somebody from Brazil give us their views on TDM in that country, which is really really interesting to see how difficult it can be to try and try from different places to to implement uh, some of these schemes because TDM in the end is the most unpopular of all these measures of sustainable transport. You can put bikeways, 
Some people will be angry. You can do pocket nuts, but some people will be angry. But you, if you do TDM, most people will be very angry. Uh, so it's it's sort of one of these things. Um, okay, and Daniel also gives us a little bit more of of details on. Thankfully, you you finally have a legal framework. Um, Yes. Yeah, you can find others sort of like Durham, and then there's other in Trondheim and Oslo. They all have these uh, road use charges, and there's a review of these in many in, in some of the documents that we've been uh, uh, sort of mentioning uh, during the webinar. Uh, it, it it's already nine. So, so I think we can wrap up and then try and find another occasion to keep on talking about these specific issues. I see that somebody from Jerusalem is actually thinking about low emission zones. I would be very happy to see low emission zones in, in a place like this. So it would be nice to, mm -hmm. to have this. Yes, so um, Carlos, one more time, very many thanks from me and I think also from the from the wider audience. Uh, audience. It was very interesting to hear um, so comprehensively uh, what are actually the experiences and the problems with uh, number plate restrictions. Um, to sum it up, um, you can basically say it's an it's an it's a nice idea. But people are actually smart, so the question is uh, who is smarter, the transport administration um, or the user, otherwise it will be simply a little bit like, like playing chess. Um, so you, you should really think forward to make it work. Um, and all the studies, the most experienced, suggests that it's not really an effective measure, that it's rather something that can eventually buy some time for you while you implement um, other more effective solutions. But you, you should really carefully uh, think about what are the costs actually of implementing such schemes. So um, y you might do something that works like kind of manually, which just requires some police power to, to enforce it, but it might uh, not be effective at all. And you might have an automated system where still people have the possibility to, to trick with different number plates. So all of these options seem to be quite and quite expensive and um, um, elaborated systems of congestion charging or uh, parking management systems should usually be preferred. Um, parking management in that context um, was in my university even uh, reviewed as a kind of indirect congestion charging. So as you don't pay when entering the city, but yeah, when you are already in the city, you uh, it depends on how much you will pay on the parking spaces available. Um, so those th things are interconnected. So um, from my side, that would be it. I have presented uh, already some further information on us. Uh, one thing that has uh, come up, the topic of low emission zones, uh, also on that uh, you will find um, a fact sheet on sutp.org. Um, that was quite interesting, and from my side, I would say uh, thank you and goodbye. In the case uh, Carlos has some further uh, points to add or another recommendation about about interesting studies or so, uh, I'll give you yeah a word <laughs> yet. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I, I think there's a lot of things to discuss uh, about this, and then, um, and I think. Many of these things are already presented in these documents, and I really encourage everybody to look at these uh, links because they're really useful and very sort of illustrative of the different examples. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much, and bye. Hope to see you again in another uh, webinar. Yes, so thank you to Carlos and to the audience, um, also to Gabriel, who, Gabriel Mackey, who has just um, give us the tip for another study from PricewaterhouseCooper, uh, from a study on um, urban access restrictions in the EU from 2010. You, so you might uh, Google that as well and uh, find some further info there. So thanks to all and uh, see you the next time then. Thank you. Bye.